I want to thank everybody um, on behalf of the IRHA and uh, Memorial Hospital and Healthcare Center to come to this webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about infant safe, um, infant safe sleep, and it takes a village. So sudden and unexpected infant death syndrome is the leading cause of death for infants one month to one, years of, one year of age. Every caregiver from parents to grandmas, daycares, uh, babysitters, et cetera, they're going to have an impact on safe sleep. And so today, uh, Kelsey Brinson is going to discuss ways to reduce the risk of the safe sleep related deaths and why it matters and how you can provide infants with a safe sleep environment. Um, so Kelsey Brinson is uh, a registered nurse and also our perinatal navigator for Healthy Start Communities That Care, which is ran through the Indiana Rural Health Association and Memorial Hospital and Healthcare Center is one of our partners. So with that, Kelsey, I'm gonna turn it over to you and mute myself and let you take it away. And Autumn, if you could start recording whenever you're, oh, you already are, Never mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, as she said, my name is Kelsey Brinson and I'm gonna be talking to you about a safe sleep today. So um, let me get going here, there we go. So first off, why do we care about safe sleep? Um, as she said, sudden unexpected infant death syndrome is the leading cause of death for infants one month to one year of age. And what that is, is a death that occurs suddenly and unexpectedly uh, that cannot immediately be, have an obvious cause until there's an investigation. So there's certain categories under this sudden in, unexpected infant death. So we call those SUIDs. And the categories underneath those are SIDs, and then unsafe sleep, which would be accidental suffocation or strangulation. And these are 100% preventable. And then there's a third, which is just an unknown cause, which is there's just incomplete information for the investigation to come up with an answer. So SIDS, which a lot of you probably um, recognize this term and probably use it to encompass everything that is a um, sleep-related death for the first year. Um, is sudden death of an infant younger than one year of age that remains unexplained after a complete inv investigation. Now, SIDS is not every single death that happens. Um, it's just kind of used as a term that everybody knows, but it's in incorrectly used a lot of the times. So this is something that is not preventable, but there are risk factors that can be reduced so that you can reduce your risk of SIDS. Um, there's newer evidence that actually shows that there's not all that many true SIDS cases. A lot of them can be seen as something that's preventable like an unsafe sleep environment. So as it's been said a couple times already um, today, the leading cause of death in infants between one month and one year of age is sudden unexpected infant death. Now this doesn't mean that infants that are born um, from newborn to one month can't die this way as well. It's just not their leading cause of death in that age group. Sleep-related deaths affect over 3,500 babies each year in the U.S. So in 1992, the American Academy of Pediatrics started a back to sleep campaign. And this campaign was to have babies lay on their back to sleep for every sleep, including naps. And our numbers went from 8,000 infant deaths per year to this 3,500 infant deaths annually. So one of the main things that I really want everyone to get out of this webinar is to get the word out. Yes, everyone gets education that comes in um, to be a new mother and a new father. They get education through their perinatal classes. And once they come up to the unit and have their baby, they get much, a lot of education on safe sleep, but it doesn't go anywhere else. So the problem is it's not trickling out into our communities and into our caregivers' homes. So this includes grandmas, after school babysitters, um, and even those in a home setting that do a daycare. Um, so nearly one in five deaths happen when babies are in someone else's care. So those are all the other people that I mentioned besides the parents. And this is often due to babies being placed on their stomach. It's called unaccustomed tummy sleeping. And that's when babies get placed on their stomach when they're usually um, used to laying on their backs. And this increases their risk of death by 18 times. 
So we're going to talk about some ways that we can reduce um, the unsafe sleep environments and help our babies live um, to their first birthday and beyond. So back to sleep is the first thing that the American Academy of Pediatrics talks about, and that's babies laying on their back for every sleep. This includes naps. So um, both the stomach and side positions actually doubles the risk of death for babies. I do want to note though that once babies can turn back and forth by themselves, you don't have to go back into their room to place them on their back again if they, just, if they do turn to their belly. But every time you, you take them into their, to their bed or their sleep area, you put them on their back first. And then if they turn, that's okay. Um, but that doesn't happen until the baby can turn back and forth by themselves freely. So one um, video that I'm going to show you from Cribs for Kids that is pretty impressive shows you the carbon uh, dioxide buildup that happens whenever a baby is laid on their belly. So as you can see here, the, the baby's breathing out, it's on its back, and the carbon uh, dioxide is freely going into the air and dispersing. And here's a baby that's on either its side or its belly. And you can see how it's starting to accumulate. It's getting trapped there, and it's starting to breathe in that carbon dioxide. You see how quickly it's built up. Let me get back to our PowerPoint here. So another um, reason that some people get a little bit wiggy about putting their babies on their back to sleep is that they're worried that baby will spit up or vomit and that they're going to choke and inhale that. And they think, well, it's probably better that I put them on their stomach in case they do that. But actually back sleeping doesn't increase the risk of choking and the anatomy for them being on their back actually helps them to clear that fluid and for it to go back into the esophagus or the food pipe where it needs to go instead of the air pipe. And remember choking doesn't, or coughing doesn't mean that they're choking, it's just a protective way to clear their air pipe. We as adults do it too when we maybe drink some liquid and it goes down our air pipe, we cough to get that out. It's a protective way to clear that air pipe and our babies do it too. So here's another great video from Cribs for Kids and it's going to show you how the food goes or how the um, spit up would go into the pipe depending on where they're sleep they're sleeping um, either on their back or their stomach. So let me show you this next video as well. When sleeping on their backs, babies are less likely to choke when they spit up. This is because of the shape of your baby's throat, which is shown in this diagram. When babies spit up while on their back, most of the liquid comes up from the stomach and out of the mouth. Any spit up that stays in the throat goes back to the lowest point, which is the food pipe. The baby then swallows the liquid back down the food pipe and into the stomach. If any liquid gets near the air pipe, the baby will cough it up to protect itself from getting liquid into the lungs. When babies spit up while laying on their bellies, 
Most of the liquid still comes up from the stomach and out of the mouth. Any spit up that stays in the throat still goes to the lowest point. But now, with the baby laying face down, the lowest point in the throat is the breathing tube that leads to the lungs. If the baby tries to breathe in before this fluid is cleared away, the liquid can go into their lungs, which is called aspiration. This can be very dangerous for the baby and why it is so important that babies sleep on their backs so they don't choke on their spit up and then breathe it into their lungs. Okay. So that video is just a really nice depiction on um, the anatomy of your of your baby's airway and the esophagus, which is the food pipe, and why it's best that they are on their back. And then another thing that we hear sometimes is, well, my baby just doesn't like to sleep on their back. Um, so first, let's talk about what a good sleeper is. I know that that's kind of a term that's thrown around, especially if your baby's sleeping through the night very early on. Babies aren't really meant to sleep through the night um, when they're really young. Their cycles are not the same as adults. And it's very, very, very normal for them to wake up every three to four hours to eat. So this is really a good sleeper is the baby that maybe sleeps three hours. So um, they also have a startle reflex, which is called the moral reflex when they're younger. And this is what happens when they're laid down on a, on a firm surface, um, it kind of triggers them and they kind of jolt. And sometimes that does wake them up. So there are some things to kind of help with that. And one of them is you can try placing your baby in their, in their safe sleep environment, their crib, before they're completely asleep and trying to avoid the reflex that way and just kind of pat them to sleep after that. Another thing that you can do is you can wait until they're kind of in a REM cycle of sleep, which usually takes about 20 minutes. So if you're not tired, um, you can hold your baby for that time and then place them in their safe sleep environment. When they're young, about less than eight weeks, you can also try swaddling. Um, so they do make great sleep sacks that have a swaddle feature that you can use. Um, and you definitely do not want to use a swaddle feature if your baby um, shows any signs of rolling over. But that can also help with that moral reflex that does go away once they get a little bit older. And one of the main things of uh, stomach sleeping is the depth, the depth of sleep. And this deep sleep puts them at an increased risk for this sleep-related death. The next thing you want is a firm sleep surface. So you want a firm infant mattress uh, to be in your crib or a firm pack and play bottom or a bassinet feature. Um, you do not want any loose objects, which is your pillows, quilts, sheepskins, or any soft objects, which is going to be any adult bed you have. No adult bed is going to be as firm as an infant um, mattress, couches and water beds included. And then the only thing that you need for a mattress is a tight fitted sheet. So it should just be your, your, your approved crib um, and a firm mattress and a fitted sheet. And that's all that's in your crib except for your baby. Stomach sleeping plus them sleeping on a soft bedding while stomach sleeping increases your baby's risk of death by 21 times. The next thing on our list is incline devices. So I know that this has been in the news a lot lately, um, especially with the Fisher Price uh, Rock and Play being recalled um, and not even on the market anymore. These incline devices are not to be used for routine sleep. What can happen with these is something called a positional asphyxiation. And what that means is your baby's airway is kind of just getting cut off because of the position that your baby is in. So if you can kind of think of like the straws that you get at a restaurant to go into your drink, if you bend it a lot, it cuts off that whole straw, right? You can't suck anything through. So that's kind of what happens to your baby's airway because they don't have the muscle control at that point. So your baby's airway kind of gets cut off in, in this position. So they shouldn't be in these positions for routine sleeping. So this does include car seats, swings, strollers, infant carriers, slings, and sitting devices. I know a lot of people say, well, my, my baby falls asleep in the car seat in the car and they're fine. Yes, they can fall asleep in the car seat in the car. And you want to make sure that your car seat is installed correctly and it's at the correct angle for your car seat. Um, which will be diff which will be shown on your car seat and in the user's user manual. But once that baby gets into your home or your babysitters, that baby needs to come out of the car seat and put into a safe sleep environment um, because that will help their their neck be in a better position to breathe. 
So here's why an adult bed is so unsafe. As you can see in the pictures below, the first one here shows you that if your bed is up against the wall, first of all, your bed can become um, an entrapment for your baby. Your, bed, your baby can get trapped in between the wall and the bed. And then all the pillows, loose sheets, blankets, your bed is full of dangers for your baby. And you can't control what you do in your sleep. Even if you um, say that you're a light sleeper and you'll know if you roll over on your baby, you can't control what you do. So you won't know what you're doing. And your risk of death increases 10 times by bed sharing. And this, in, this includes um, being at a babysitter too. Babies should not be sharing any sleep environment with another child. This includes babies, um, toddlers, they shouldn't be in the same sleeping environment and twins as well. Twins should be in their own sleep area. And couches and chairs are especially dangerous. They're about 50 times um, more dangerous as a risk for death. And of the sleep related deaths in the US, half were found to be sleeping with their parents. Here's an example of a safe crib environment. As you can see, it's a firm mattress, a fitted sheet, um, the baby there is in a nice sleep sack and has pacifier, which we'll talk about here in a second. So said it numerous times um, already, but no soft objects or loose bedding anywhere in the crib, no stuffed animals, um, nobody in the sleep area uh, but the baby, and no bumper pads. And we're going to even talk about those mesh, those new mesh ones that are out, not even those. Um, you want to use an approved crib, so nothing older than 10 years. Uh, no more drop downs. The cribs used to have this drop down feature, so it would be easier for you to lean over and get your baby. Those actually can entrap your baby, um, so those aren't made anymore. You don't want to use those anymore. And we're going to talk about the soda can test. So a lot of people might get their cribs from like maybe a garage sale or maybe it's a family heirloom that's been passed down through the years. So cribs used to be made with a lot um, bigger um, area for the slats. And those would cause um, maybe a head entrapment. And that's why people were using bumper pads. Well, now there's new standards on these cribs and they have um, narrower slats. So here's the soda can test. You shouldn't be able to fit a soda can through the slat. So that'll let you know that the slats are small enough. And then there's no need for bumper pads anymore. And about the mesh ones, a lot of people wonder about that because why shouldn't my baby be able to breathe through that? Well, the problem with those is it can cause um, strangulation with the cords that attaches to it and can cause entrapment with it being um, right up against the mattress. It can, your baby can get entrapped in there. And also safety for later, once your baby starts to start um, standing up, it can use it as a way to stand up and maybe fall out of the crib. If, if you're worried about the legs getting caught, that's a great use for the wearable blanket to not get the legs caught in the slats. So pacifiers. Pacifiers have actually been shown to reduce uh, or to have a protective effect on SIDS. So we usually say once breastfeeding is established, if you're breastfeeding or if mother is breastfeeding, which is usually about three to six weeks, um, consider offering that passy at a nap time and bedtime. We don't force pacifiers, but we offer so um, two things that you do not want on your pacifiers. You don't want those stuffed animals on there because that can cause uh, suffocation risk. And those latches that keep them from falling off the clothing or falling out and they attach to the clothing, those can be a strangulation risk. So you don't want anything on your passy. You want your passy just free. And just a side note, don't put sugar water on your pacifier. Um, you want to prevent cavities on those new teeth forming. Uh, so again, it's an offering. It's not a requirement for the baby to, to have it. Smoking. So smoke ex exposure can affect the baby both during pregnancy and after birth, and it can be affected by anybody that the baby comes in contact with. So you don't want to allow uh, others to smoke around the baby. This includes home and uh, daycare settings. So if smoking must occur in those settings, um, preferably it's done outside away from the baby and preferably your clothes are changed before you touch baby and you wash your hands before holding baby. The reasoning here is that your risk is doubled for SIDS with passive smoke. And that's not just secondhand, it's thirdhand as well. So a lot of people know what secondhand is and it's the, um, when a smoker expels the smoke and then you breathe it in. But third hand smoke is when it gets trapped into surfaces like 
walls of your home and the fabric in your couches and the fabric on your clothes, this can also be passed to baby as well. So it's very important to be in a smoke-free environment to reduce your risk of SIDS. You wanna prevent overheating. I know a lot of people worry about this when they worry baby's cold. Really, baby is most likely comfortable if you're comfortable. So no loose blankets or anything like that in the crib. You don't wanna have head coverings on the baby. This is where your sleep sack or wearable blanket comes in great. Um, and babies really shouldn't have any more than one more layer than you are than you have um, to be comfortable in the same room that you're in. So uh, there's a note here about swaddling. There is no evidence that swaddling reduces SIDS. It is purely for comfort for the baby. But again, if you choose to swaddle your baby with like a wearable, blank, uh, a wearable blanket that has a swaddle feature on it, it definitely needs to be discontinued when the infant shows signs of rolling over and many daycare centers will stop it at eight weeks. The next thing we're gonna talk about is products that claim safe sleep. So I know there's a lot of stuff out there on social media right now about, oh, this reduces SIDS and this makes your baby sleep longer. These are not tested for effectiveness or safety. They're inconsistent with safe sleep recommendations. You wanna be careful for things that say positioners or sleepers or nappers. Those are, those are hot words that you wanna watch out for that do not mean safe sleep. So all these, I know that I've seen lately like um, a little canopy that goes in your crib. Really the only thing that you need in your crib is a firm mattress and a fitted sheet. That should be all that's in your crib. Um, so I know there's also some like uh, pack and plays that have a napper feature on top that has like um, little buckles on it and stuff. That's not safe uh, for your baby to sleep in. Your, your bassinet should only have, or your pack and play can have a bassinet feature, but it has to have a firm surface. It should not be these things called nappers. The next thing we're going to talk about is home monitors. So it's, it's fine to use a home monitor, which is a video or audio um, monitor, or I know that those outlets are really popular, those cardiorespiratory ones. They should not be used in place of doing all the safe sleep um, features though. So what I mean by that is don't have a video on your baby and then put a blanket on them and say, well, I'm going to watch them and it'll be fine. Your baby, you can't watch your baby at all times. So while these are fine to use, you still need to do all the other safe sleep measures that we've already talked about. So here you can see that baby has a separate sleep surface. So that's very important, both at home and at daycare. Like I stated before, there should be no other um, children in the sleep surface um, or adults in the sleep surface with the baby. You can see here mom is on her own bed with all of her dangerous things like pillows and blankets and baby is safe in the crib next to her. So at home that's actually recommended is room sharing, uh, not bed sharing for at least the first six months and preferably, preferably for the first year. So you never want your baby to sleep on any surface with an adult, other child, or pet. So pets something that you want to think about too both at home and at daycare. Um, cats really like warm things and babies are warm. So sometimes those cats can get in there with those babies. So um, you wanna watch your cats too. Um, so if you do room sharing at, at home, uh, your SIDS risk is reduced by 50 cents, uh, 50%. And um, we're gonna talk about the, you can't control how tired you get with the breastfeeding. So breastfeeding is great and is associated with a re reduced risk of SIDS actually and especially exclusive breastfeeding uh, for the first six months has an increased protective effect. But you also get very tired with uh, breastfeeding. So that's why you can't control how tired you're gonna get. Room sharing is your safest alternative to co-sleeping. So you have that, that safe environment for your baby in the same room with you. So after you're done breastfeeding, you put your baby in that safe environment. We need to avoid alcohol and illicit drug use. And this is any caregiver for an infant. Um, it can alter your alertness and um, you can fall asleep while holding the infant, which is dangerous. And for moms, prenatal and postnatal exposure um, increases the baby's risk of SIDS. This last one, immunizations. I know that care, um, care providers in uh, daycare can't really affect this one as much as it's, it's a largely a parent thing. 
um, unless there's a requirement at that daycare. However, uh, infants should be immunized, immunized in accordance with the recommendations from AAP and CDC. There has been no evidence to show that immunizations causes SIDS. It actually has shown that it is protective against um, SIDS. And then supervised awake tummy time. While it's not necessarily a safe, a safe sleep initiative, it is um, a good thing for babies to have for their development. And it also helps with that um, worry that parents have of their baby having a flat head because they're on their back to sleep all the time. So for um, tummy time, we, we say tummy to play and back to sleep. And, um, but tummy time always has to be supervised. So you want to make sure that there's someone with your baby at all times um, whenever you are on your tummy. So great things um, for caregivers to know and for parents to ask when they go to a caregiver for the first time is where is my baby going to sleep? Is there enough sleep surfaces for every baby in your care? What does the sleep surface look like? Is there anything in your sleep surface? Do you have any animals? Do you smoke in the home? And what do you do about tummy time? Are you always with baby during tummy time? So great questions to have on board before you go to your caregiver. And then there's this. So I know that a lot of us on this webinar probably grew up in a time where we slept on our bellies as babies. So it's hard for um, other generations to kind of understand why things are changing and why it matters because it's a wonder you ever survived as a baby, right? So I know that we've probably heard that before. So what we kind of say to that, um, to help um, new moms kind of navigate that and learn from that is we learn new things every day, right? So sometimes past practices are no longer correct or safe. And I love the way that Cribs for Kids puts it. They put it this way. They say, if we know better, we do better, right? So we know better now. So we know better that the baby needs to be on their back and that's the safest place for the baby to be, um, to sleep. So, and just like it says here, car seats weren't required in the past either, but we use them now because we know that it's the best thing for the baby. So that's a great way to just kind of um, help in kind of navigating when other people don't necessarily know why we're doing this or maybe think that we're just um, being overprotective of this uh, because we turned out okay, right? Um, so with that all being said, we will have a question available for questions later. But I want to introduce our um, guest speaker. Her name is uh, Sarah Brody, and she's going to tell you about her daughter Emily's story. Sarah? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Sarah Brody, and I am from Scott County. Um, I have, my husband and I have two children. We have one that is three and a half. And um, we also have Emily, who is forever six months old. Um, Emily passed away last, um, last year on May 30th, so um, we're actually coming up on that year mark uh, this Saturday. Um, there are a lot of factors that contributed to Emily's death. She was put down for a nap on her belly on an adult mattress at her babysitter's home. Um, she was left on that mattress alone for several hours and was not checked on. I was under the impression that she was always sleeping in the pack and play that we had provided, um, but I found out that that was not the case um, shortly after her, we, we had had her funeral. There were actually two pack and plays in the same bedroom with her that day, um, but the sitter was using them for two older kids so that they could not, um, so they could not get out of that pack and play if they woke up during their nap. Um, so the factors of her being placed on her belly on an adult mattress and then the lack of supervision ultimately led to Emily suffocating. She was not able to get herself out of such a dangerous situation because she could only roll from her back onto her belly. She could not, she couldn't move herself from her belly to her back yet. Um, the sitter did admit later that she was aware of the ABCs of safe sleep and she had been placing Emily on the bed out of, um, I guess, a, a convenience for her. She said she had done that with all of the kids she had watched in the past, so she just didn't think anything bad would happen because she had done it so many times before. 
Um, the pathologist has explained that she either died um, from suffocation from the mattress or the pillows and blankets that were on um, that bed at the time with her. Um, the sitter had no idea that she wasn't breathing until she went to get her when I showed up after work. She carried her out to me, um, screaming that a, that a blanket had been so tied around her. And I just, at that time, I, I, nothing registered to me on what had happened. Um, I ended up giving her CPR on the babysitter's back porch that day um, until the EMT arrived. And we were driven to the hospital um, by a police officer. We later found out that Emily had already passed away before I arrived that day. And Emily's cause of death is labeled as an unsafe sleep environment, which is the sewage that was spoken about earlier. So I did really want to point out that she did not pass away from SIDS because her death can be explained. And it was because of, of the suffocation. Um, I've been probably speaking out about Emily's story and safe sleep probably for about seven months now and the reason that I do that is just I don't want anyone else to go through what we've gone through especially what Emily went through but I think um you know like Kelsey said earlier we need to get the word out because papers are given out or, or things are handed out and we're supposed to read it but no one is really talking about it very much um and I want people to know that this can happen to anyone if, if they don't follow safe sleep practices. If it hadn't happened, if it hasn't happened to you or it didn't happen to you, then your baby was just really lucky. Emily was really lucky too all of those other times that the babysitter had put her on that bed until the day that she wasn't lucky anymore. Um, so that's kind of the short version of, of what happened to Emily, but. Um, I think that sums up everything that I wanted to share about her story. Thank you so much for telling your story. It's so important to get this out to everyone and um, let them know the dangers of unsafe sleeping. Thank you. I want to open up the floor for any questions now. Heather, do you see any questions in the chat box? I do not. I've been monitoring both. Okay. I do want to um, share my contact info for anyone that needs it. And then also um, below here is information for any um, daycare centers that are wishing to have more training or um, inquire about licensure. For Indiana, there is uh, 4C of Southern Indiana. And here is their website and their number as well for those that are wanting more information on training opportunities. So Heather, if there's nobody having- I don't, I, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to um, tell Sarah, thank you for sharing your story. And uh, I got on your Facebook page while you were talking and um, asked to join because she's got a really great Facebook page yes. um, all for Emily and mm -hmm. some really great resources on her on that page and information and you get to see Emily a little bit more she's a doll baby um, and this couldn't have been easy coming up on the first anniversary so I just wanted to thank you personally for sharing um, Emily's story with us and touching the lives of so many other people yeah you're welcome And encourage um, those that are listening on the call, if you do have any questions and you see that uh, slide that um, Kelsey provided there at the end with her contact information, um, Kelsey and, and her crew are amazing and uh, just easy to, easy to talk to and ask questions and full of information. And if they don't know the answer, they will find it for you. Um, so just, you know, just don't ever hesitate to reach out to Kelsey uh, by cell or email. And if you have questions after this, um, you know, like I said, feel free to email her. Uh, but if that's all, then I, I think we're done. Thank you.